Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with a fact. Did you know that every day, every year, according to the World Health Organization, over a million babies die on the first and only day of life? And many more are handicapped long term as a consequence of being born. That means that we are the lucky ones because we have survived. Now, the reason why babies die shortly during, during childbirth or shortly after birth is complicated, and there are many, many reasons for that. Many babies die because they're born too soon, and that's a story for another day. But a large number of babies die because they run into problems during childbirth, and we don't recognise it. Now, why is that? Well, many babies globally are not monitored at all during childbirth. Nobody listens and checks them. And for those babies that we do look at, what do we do? We listen to the heart rate. That's the only thing that midwives and doctors have. If you were going into hospital for an operation and the anaesthetist and the surgeon said, don't worry, I'm going to look after you really, really carefully, I'm either going to do nothing or I'm going to feel your pulse. <laughs> what would you think about that? I mean, personally, I would be horrified, but that's what we do to babies who are being born every day, every minute of the day across the world. Now, I'm an obstetrician and I deliver babies and I work on labour and, and I just think that's unacceptable. With the advanced ascent technology, surely we must be able to do more than, if we want to, feel a baby's pulse. So if you look across medicine um, and surgery, many of the advances in medicine and surgery have come from unconventional partnerships. Take, for example, ultrasound. Now, I'm sure most people in this um, audience have had an ultrasound or know somebody that's had an ultrasound. And certainly, I had ultrasound scan when I was pregnant with my two children, and I loved it. It was great. It was reassuring. But maybe less of you are actually aware of how ultrasound was invented. Ultrasound was invented because an obstetrician, like me, spoke to an engineer. Now, Ian Donald was an obstetrician, and when he was a child, he was fascinated by machines and, and equipment and um, electronics. And his career was interrupted when he, with the Second World War, when he went off the RAF, and he was a very decorated pilot. And when he was a pilot, he became very familiar with a technique called echo sounding, which he used to sort of look at um, submarines under the, under the sea. Now, clearly, babies and submarines are very different. But there are some similarities. They, they both move, albeit in different ways. They both live in fluid of some description. And they're both quite difficult to detect from the outside of the surface of the sea or the surface of the skin. So when he went back to Glasgow to be a professor of obstetrics, he wondered whether this echo sounding could be applied to pregnancy. It was thought of a bit of a crackpot idea, but he found an engineer and they got together and he found another obstetrician and they did lots of inventing and sort of designing, etc. And eventually, modern ultrasound was born and the rest is history. And that arose because he thought outside the box and he dared to do something different that people, to be honest, laughed at him when he started off. Now, that's a great story. How on earth does that relate to me? Because I'm clearly not Ian Donald. So, well, I'm an obstetrician, and I also quite like tinkering with things when I was a child. I used to make my brother's airfix models. Um, I would say better than he did, but he would probably uh, disagree with me. And um, I, I, as it's already been said, I, I've, I like working with engineers, and I like inventing things. So how on earth did this happen? Well, it happened one day when I was walking through the Lothian Birth Centre. Now, I work very close with my, with my midwives, and I was chatting to my colleague, Shona, and she had just looked after a mother that had given birth to a baby in water. And water is increasingly used by women. It's very relaxing, it's empowering, and it means that they may have less pain control during labour, which is great. And I said, Shona, that sounded wonderful. And she said, she said, it was great until the baby was born. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I couldn't see the baby coming out. I said, well, you must be able to see the baby coming out. She said, no. I said, well, what do you use? She said, well, we have a handheld mirror in one hand and a torch in the other. I said, what? I said, and then what do you do? She said, well, we have these pools. And I don't know if many people have seen birthing pools, but they're quite big. So then she kind of guddles in the birthing pool with a mirror in one hand and a torch in the other. The woman doesn't move, and she can't see the baby coming out. And I wasn't an engineer, but I thought, surely this is just bonkers. It's just nuts. I mean, God, like, anyway, so I said, this is nuts, Shona, sure, absolutely nuts. She said, I know it's nuts. So I said, well, we must do something about it. So what would we do? So I said, well, why don't we try and get some money? So I happened to meet this engineer, 
at some, I think it was some networking event. Um, and I applied for a grant with Mark, my engineering colleague, and Shona. And I think, to be honest, much to our surprise, I got some money. So I said, great, we can invent something that will solve your problem, Shona. So engineers are fantastic, really, really bright individuals, and they love solving problems. But they have to understand the problem to solve. Otherwise, they will design something fantastic that's utterly useless in the clinical environment. So Mark had absolutely you know, no idea what a water birth was. So I'm, I invited Mark and his colleagues, most of whom were ma uh, male, to come to our hospital. So they came in, <laughs> Shona and her colleagues had really gone to a lot of effort. They'd inflated birthing pools in this room and had got plastic dolls and were busy <laughs> pretending to give birth to these plastic dolls in this, this sort of room. And Mark and his colleagues looked like they had landed in outer space because they really did not know what to think about it, and they were sucked up against the wall with their iPhones and uh, holding on to dear life because it was clearly such an alien environment. But actually, we then got some Lego out and some fuzzy sort of straw things, and they played with that, and, and, and that calmed them down a bit. And then we actually... We, and and that, that sort of settled things down. And, and then we actually got us all together again, and by the end of that sort of session... One of the engineers got into the pool and also tried to give birth to this plastic doll. <laughs> and, and actually, we were talking the same language by the end, and they understood the problem. And we had some idea that you kind of wanted some sort of stick on some sort of, sort of pole that, to make it easier for the midwives, so they didn't have to bend, they didn't strain their backs. So we started doing something called product design, which I had no idea what that was about. We, but we drew drawings, and we did sort of... Um, we voted for designs, etc. And I was really excited when the first prototype arrived. Now, something had slightly got lost in translation at this point because the engineer that designed it, unfortunately, was not one of the ones that had come to the room. So he had, had this mirror, which was fine, and it was attached to this pole that was about two metres long, and the whole thing was really heavy. So it was almost a kind of two-person job. One person had to hold the handle, the other one held the mirror at the other end. And, and they could actually see this big ball that you would use for kind of Pilates in the birthing pool, but it was clearly utterly useless because it was such, a, such an enormous thing. So we went right back to the drawing board. We got other engineers involved from Loughborough, which was fantastic, and they, they sent this wonderful mirror up, which would have been great. It looked wonderful. I just took, took it out of the packet, bent it, and instantly snapped it. So that, that clearly was not very robust. <laughs> and we, we kept going, and, and I ended up in some dodgy whiskey warehouse in Glasgow trying to speak to product design engineers, which was really outside my comfort zone. And eventually, we came up with an idea and, um, a, and a design that worked. And the first thing we came up with is this, if I can get it out of my bag, so they're all getting tangled together, is this, which um, this is difficult to tell inside, but that's actually a toothbrush inside this little handle. So this is a sort of mirror on a bendy pool that actually it works. Um, and that looks, the midwives are very excited. We have not actually used it in the pool yet. But that's a bit of a clunky thing to put together, so we've then um, extended it further, and we've come up with model 2.0, which is much, much nicer, I think, so with a mirror and the batteries. So this actually is what the midwives want. It doesn't look very complicated, but it actually it's taken a long time to get there. So when a woman comes and wants to give birth in water, instead of having one hand and another hand, you've got a simple thing in and out, you've got a hand free. Simple concept, simple design, but it took a long time to get there. Now, my university and Mark's university, I think, were slightly bemused at what we were up to, um, as, to be honest, were we. And, but then we started to win awards. So these mirrors have won product design awards and um, have got a startup company, and there's now a permanent exhibit at my university as an example of what you can do with interdisciplinary research. And although we haven't got it into the clinic yet, I'm hoping that we will do it at some point, because the midwives keep asking me for the mirror, because clearly there's a problem We've solved it, and they want to, to actually use it in clinical practice. But importantly, um, joking aside, what this has led to is a long-standing collaboration and expansion of interdisciplinary research. And one of the problems that we're currently trying to solve is how to monitor babies better in labour. Because I've, as I got back to the beginning, what we have, I think, is just old-fashioned. So we've got medics and we've got engineers working in the same laboratory. It's really exciting. They come up with fantastic ideas. We're at an early stage, but I very much hope in the not-too-distant future we'll have something that actually will solve a problem that I think desperately needs to be solved. 
So what I'll say to you is I'll just give you a question. I'm going to pose a question to you at the end of this. Is I'm sure all of you in whatever walks of life you're working will have a problem that might be difficult to solve. And I thoroughly enjoy working with people outside of my discipline. It's not easy. It's challenging. Communication can be really difficult. Um, but it's fun, it's exciting, and it's innovative. So if you've got an idea and they've got a problem that you're having difficulty solving, what's stopping you speaking to people that you don't understand the language you're speaking, to, speaking about? What I can guarantee to you is where you, is where you think you'll go is, is not where you're going to end up. You'll go to a very, very different place. But it might be fun, it might be really exciting, you might invent something really, really quite cool. So what's stopping you? Thank you.